sister and like, you know, hang out with my friends in New York. I mean, but that's the fun part about New York. It winds up being a little family in itself. So it's, it works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we are live. Okay, okay, here we are. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the Tenement Museum's virtual book talk series. My name is Arabella Friedland and I am the retail marketing associate at the Tenement Museum. While this program is free, if you would like to make a donation or are able to, as always, we really appreciate it. And to buy tonight's book, just follow the link later to our online shop. The phrase do it yourself or DIY is as much a call to creativity as it is a call to action. Inarguably, the Tenement Museum was founded by Ruth Abrams and Anita Jacobson in this philosophy. It's a pleasure to introduce the author of DIY on the Lower East Side, Buildings, Books, and Art after the 1975 crisis, fiscal crisis. Andrew Strombeck is a professor of English at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. Along with writing DIY on the Lower East Side, Books, Buildings, and Art after the 1975 fiscal crisis, he's the co-editor with John Thomas Tremblay at Avant Gardes and Crisis, Art and Politics in the Long 1970s. His essays have appeared in journals such as Post 45 Peer Reviewed, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Contemporary Literature, Modern Fiction Studies, African American Review, and Cultural Critique. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is a book often about artists and writers not only finding the inspiration to create, but also the cause. How did you become a writer and what drew you to New York in this period? Oh, Andrew, I think we lost you. Just give us one second, folks. You know, part of being at the Tenement Museum is a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, as somebody's worked on these for the last year, it is a pleasure to be part of this and to have you all here for, through all the snafus and all the really interesting things we're able to bring to the picture here. So in reading this book, uh, it's been a really interesting experience for me. I'm actually a second generation uh, New York artist. Both of my parents are artists uh, from the 1970s and 80s in New York. Uh, they were downtown. They uh, each really went and found their own way of being through this. So for me, it was a great play to connect to this and to see Andrew again. Hi, Andrew. You're muted. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was that your connection or my connection? I don't know. We were fine over here. So okay. as I was yeah. saying, thank you for joining us again. Uh, this book is often about artists and writers not only finding the inspiration to create, certainly through difficulties, less so technical, uh, but how did you become a writer and what drew you to this period in New York? Oh, yeah. Thanks for asking that. Well, um, I am an English professor by trade. So uh, it's, in many ways, writing is sort of part of my life um, or part of my job. Uh, so uh, before this book, I was working on a book about conspiracy theory that I, I sort of uh, jettisoned. Uh, that was my dissertation. Uh, and so what drew me to this book and this material uh, is partly biographical. Um, my mom grew up in a housing project. Um, that was 95% Puerto Rican, according to her uh, recollection. Uh, and they, they, they sort of lived in uh, somewhat uh, near poverty. They were uh, Irish uh, sort of descendants of Irish immigrants. Uh, and so their New York uh, seemed to me very different uh, than the New York that I would experience uh, sort of visiting um, uh, even in the 90s, but certainly as you moved into the 2000s, uh, the, the, this kind of uh, vastly prosperous place. Uh, I used to visit New York a lot. Um, I, live, I grew up in Kingston in the Hudson Valley, so I, I sort of would be down there. Uh, as a teenager, I never went to the Lower East Side uh, because of the, the way uh, it was during that era, but I was always very fascinated by it. And then in particular, what, what drew me to the this era intellectually was the work of this writer, Kathy Acker, uh, who some of you may be familiar with, but I, I had written about Acker before and I'd read a lot about Acker, uh, but it struck me that nobody was really writing about, at the time at least, uh, about the kind of context for Acker, like, like who she was talking to. Uh, I'd known that she'd been in touch with artists, that there were other people, other writers around her uh, working in, in New York in the 70s and 80s. But um, Acker was very much received as this sort of um, 
I don't know, uh, uh, girl postmodernist, uh, sort of in quotes, uh, the, the kind of writer you would read alongside Don DeLillo and, and Thomas Minchin if you, you know, wanted a sort of a female take on those trends. But I was, uh, I wanted to know more about what her life looked like. And that's what sort of led me to this expansive uh, landscape that I describe in the book. That's fantastic. I didn't realize it all started from Acker. Would you yeah. mind for our audience setting the scene for what 1975 New York fiscal crisis, what it was and what the city looked like then? Sure, absolutely. So uh, in starting in 1974, the city had always, I guess like all cities, uh, borrowed money to keep its books going. Uh, and as a result of uh, what we call white flight, right? You have people moving uh, out to Long Island, you have people moving upstate, you have sort of people moving everywhere, right? Uh, well, largely white people, right? This is sort of a known phenomenon in the, in the post-war era. And then you also have uh, the decline of manufacturing in New York. New York is never a, a huge manufacturing city, but there is a, deg a degree of manufacturing happening, you know, especially in places like Brooklyn. Uh, and then that's all, all of that, all those manufactured goods are run out of the port, which, you know, at the, at the time is downtown, like, you know, where the piers are, with where the piers were. Once the port new, moves to New Jersey, you, you start to see all this money kind of flowing out of the city. So anyway, the city ends up broke uh, in 1974. And what's unique about this moment, uh, and there are uh, historians who uh, note the contrast between the 75 crisis and the earlier 66 crisis, which in some ways had similar dynamics, in 74 and 75, so it, during this era, the creditors refused to extend any more debt to the city. And so the city's kind of uh, on the ropes. And uh, what ends up happening uh, is that the this kind of unelected board, um, uh, first it's the Municipal Assistance Board uh, known as Big Mac, uh, and then later it's the Emergency Financial Control Board. Uh, this was a board that was appointed by New York State uh, and was large, largely consisted of like sort of, you know, financial leaders, uh, you know, kind of leaders of real estate, uh, they, they take over the city, uh, they take over the city's budget at least, and what they immediately start doing is kind of slashing uh, programs, uh, they, they cut funds to hospitals, schools, uh, even the police, um, certainly uh, they cut direct benefits. And so the city really experiences this great shift. Um, and it's, uh, so some people describe this as kind of the, the um, first big decline of the welfare state. So, so as you move in uh, the 70s and 80s, uh, Reagan, uh, was Reagan's elected, he makes this big sort of deal about uh, attacking kind of the, these like New Deal era programs. These are programs that conservatives had wanted to sort of destroy, um, you know, since the 30s. And New York in some ways, like it was, it was almost a more sort of intense uh, version of those programs because New York had very generous uh, benefits uh, in the period before 1975. And so you see all these programs being sort of attacked. And so then what happens is all of these programs are slashed. Uh, this is a, a further kind of withdrawal of funds from the city. And then neighborhoods that were already kind of like on the edge, you know, sort of struggling uh, because of those kinds of economic trends uh, start to decay even further. And so uh, when places like, especially the Lower East Side uh, and the South Bronx are like, they just become filled with abandoned buildings uh, because it becomes more profitable for landlords to kind of walk away from these buildings uh, than it is to sort of hang on and try to collect rent from people who are increasingly having difficulty paying rent. So it's just this, this um, intense concentration of uh, sort of uh, withdrawn funds and then a, a sort of decayed environment, uh, which, you know, it's the, these are all these like famous images you see of these like decaying buildings um, in, in the city, right? So, yeah. One of which you used for your cover of the South Bronx, which I'm going right. to present. Uh, yeah. Can you Okay, so this image, can you explain to this? This is your cover. It's a great Yeah, image. yeah. So this is uh these are this is from a series of photos taken by this guy Harold Rosenberg, and they're really fantastic. Uh they're just they're always these people that uh that are very sort of dignified and kind of yeah. um like like you look at them and, and you just want to you, you believe that they have kind of these like intact lives that should be sort of cared for. And Rosenberg situates them against these landscapes, right? So you see these people that that are not kind of, uh, so, you, you know, the idea 
often that circulated around the crisis was that there were all these populations in New York that were not deserving of help, right? That were that had sort of brought on uh, brought failure onto themselves through their own choices, right? Uh, but but here, right, uh, you can't make that assumption about these figures, right? Uh, but uh, certainly the you know the what you see in the background, those kind of all those bricks falling apart, uh, the those empty uh, windows in the buildings, that was very characteristic of. Uh, neighborhood. Uh, this uh, this is again from the South Bronx, but you could see images like this in the Lower East Side as well, like these kind of uh, just completely burned out buildings uh, that that kind of became um, that were real that 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 had this kind of physicality to them and that represented real conditions, but also became this kind of imaginary uh, site of this uh, like a place that you could sort of do anything because because uh, no one cared, right? It, it was uh, the term that the geographer Neil Smith uses for the Lower East Side of the Era is a frontier, right? So he calls it this kind of so so the. Um, yeah, I was I'm drawn to this the the way that this landscape is both uh, represents real conditions, but also became this like imaginary place. Yeah. So you can go on to the Fechner now. Absolutely. And what I've heard through these buildings that they actually had a sound. You could hear wind whistling through them because they. Uh, were yeah, yeah. I really love that idea. Yeah, yeah poignant. Yeah, yeah. yeah so very poignant. This is your cover. This is John Fechner's "Broken Promises, False Promises." Why yeah. did you choose this? And can you tell us a little bit of the history of this image? Sure, sure. Um, okay, so the reason I chose it, there, there's a whole bunch of reasons why I chose it. I mean, uh, first of all, the book is called Books, Buildings, and Art. Uh, and so what we have here, uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in obviously the literary production of the Lower Side, but what we have here is a, a piece of art that's literally made by printing words on a building. And so this to me really uh, you know, it encapsulated sort of all the themes of the book, the idea that uh, there was a kind of literature being produced in buildings like this, uh, and that buildings like this uh, provided uh, all this kind of inspiration, but also sort of the conditions to produce this literature, right? Uh, in some ways, uh, one of the, the ideas coursing through the book is that these were people that were able to write things that they couldn't really have written uh, in creative writing programs or anything like that. Uh, it was really a product of sort of cheap rent, right? Like you could, you didn't really have to worry too much about holding down a, a well-paid job because, uh, because rent was so cheap. Uh, but the other thing that I find really compelling about this image, Fechner did apparently make it, um, so yeah, sorry. What I'm compelled by is this notion of broken promises. Uh, so Fechner was apparently responding directly to Jimmy Carter who did tour the South Bronx at some point, and I guess uh, indicated that you know the federal government would sort of get some aid to the neighborhood. But I also see the broken promises is very um, redolent of what happens during the, the fiscal crisis, right? Like I think that New York had made a lot of promises um, just in practice, right? To the people in neighborhoods like this that, that it then broke. Uh, it, it decided really that the city was no longer uh, for uh, the people on the slide before, right? That the city was really uh, there to sort of attract international wealth, right? That the city was going to focus on um, on the financial sector, uh, on the real estate sector, that it was, it was going to be sort of, um, yeah, no longer this kind of uh, whatever sort of, you know, uh, great sort of polyglot city where, where all sorts of people could come together and, and sort of, um, uh, make it right. You can make it anywhere, sort of thing. Uh, if you make it here, sort of thing. Uh, but that it was going to be a, a city for very specific kinds of people, right? And so that that's that's sort of the broken promise. Uh, so yeah, I found so much um, so much in this image that I, that I found really compelling. Yeah. You know? And then um, so if you want to flip to the the next image, uh, the other thing that is really interesting about this, uh, and this is a it's it's, it's a variation on this image, uh, but. Uh, so Carter visits the South Bronx and then Reagan later visits uh, this during the, the 1980 presidential campaign. And so um, one of the arguments I make in the book, and this is also uh, like I, I, I'm not alone in making this argument, but New York and other cities were sort of held up as an example of how all these kinds of policies that were supposed to help um, the kind of uh, marginalized, this sort of impoverished uh, in the the nation had failed, right? So all these, the war on poverty had failed, the New Deal had failed. And this kind of thing was used by Reagan as kind of exhibit one, right? This is, this is like, if this still exists, uh, then then we, we can no longer have a welfare state or anything like the, the welfare state. Uh, we have to sort of back out. Um, government has failed, right? And the market should do its work. Uh, the book is, so the book is, it, it 
takes place under the, the transition to what people call neoliberalism, right? Whereby the state is no longer supposed to provide uh, solutions to kind of social problems. Instead, markets are supposed to do that work. And uh, my feeling is that um, artists and writers had a very uh, complex role to play in this transition. On the one hand, they were, uh, you know, I, I'm drawn to the people in the book because they they critique that that transition. They critique the transition of the Lower East Side from a kind of place where working class people could sort of survive to the place it is now, where you know it's largely kind of like tech entrepreneurs and uh, copywriters and, and whatever, right? Uh, so they critique that transition, even as they sort of enable it. Uh, so one of the things that they may touch on later is that uh, do it yourself is, is such a kind of uh, mixed phrase in that sense, because on the one hand, it, it's all those kinds of wonderful things that you made reference to in, in terms of the Tenement Museum, uh, this kind of building up a place block by block, like kind of uh, uh, making it one's own. But it, it, to me, it also became this idea that like the state is no longer going to help you. So you're on your own. You're going to have to do it yourself, and I think Reagan is a, a sort of fit symbol for that. You, you can you can lean on that too heavy, but it's true that people associate Reagan with sort of the rise of neoliberalism. That those policies really, uh, those policies which in some ways were began in the 1970s fiscal crisis, were sort of like uh, really brought to a national level by Reagan. So many reasons to use that image. Absolutely, you know, and this image is associated. This art is associated with Reagan, even though it was initially there to sort of invoke Carter and to yes. question Carter, which is That's interesting. Right. And, and his, the artist's relationship with that, which I don't think he was, that wasn't what he was intending, but it also still drew attention to his work. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I think he has really, really, I, I talked to him at some point and he had really, really mixed feelings about the ways that this image was going to be, was put to use. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, and just this disinvestment with uh, landlords and disinvestment of New York City at a time. And you look at how New York is viewed by outsiders or even just different people within the city. That infamous headline uh, daily from the Daily News, you know, Ford to City Drop Dead is actually a mystery. Yeah. It never happened. But it, it costs Ford his job. And this other attitude, you think about the Fear City pamphlets, which now is just a t-shirt. I don't know if we think about what it's, uh, what it's from, but it was, you know, distributed by Plains Clothes Policemen. And it was this how to survive guide in New York, which just uh, mainly yeah. about, you should stay away from New York, just don't come. And they were distributing that at the airports. Yeah, it's wild. Uh, uh, New York did develop this, this such as like, it, it's those, it's those pamphlets, but you think of all the films too, Fort Apache, oh. the Bronx, Escape from New York, uh, these kind of like, the, all of which depicted New York as this like insane landscape, you know, where where uh, you would get sort of, I, I remember being warned, right, that you had to keep your wallet in your front pocket, don't go on the subway, right? Like it was this, it was supposed to be this kind of like really uh, wild place, right? Uh, which uh, again, I think is, it became really fascinating for the writers that I take up because I think on the one hand, you do see a lot of writing. Uh, I mean, and this happens with art as well in terms of graffiti art, right? You have a lot of writing that seems to, it's not precisely celebrate, but it is sort of like, uh, it does sort of take advantage of that sense of this kind of lawless place, uh, this place where, where you know, I guess there's, there is this idea of uh, being an artist and sort of exposing oneself to risk and danger. And so, so to some degree that was kind of embraced and along mm -hmm. aside with that, I mentioned the graffiti art, there, there was this notion that out of this decay uh, would come this kind of spontaneous creativity, right? Because like, uh, you know, there's this idea that people awesome. that are yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. There's possibility. It's playtime to some extent. Yeah, it's playtime. Yeah, There's that's right. That's right. People. And you think a lot of the people who moved back were children of white flight, whose parents yes, had to right. get them out of, you know, we're, we're going to get you to the suburbs. We're going to have this, you know, wonderful life. And then you have these kids, they grow up, they're like 18, 20, 22. And that to them is so oppressive that they moved back in theory to the same buildings, the same tenements that their families left. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Families move out to the suburbs for a safer, more mm -hmm. secure life, which is also boring as hell and sort of oppressive as hell, especially if you're queer, right? Like, especially, uh, you know, like if you're, if, if you're living, I don't know, uh, 
Long Island or, or, or Ohio, God help you, right? Uh, you couldn't be out, uh, but you. But if you moved back to New York, you, especially in the Lower East Side, where you know, nobody really kind of cared, right? You could be out, and you could you could sort of like uh, find a sort of degree of freedom. Um, I mean, Lynn Tillman, uh, who's one of the writers I take up as well, talks about this in terms of women as well. That like what was in the suburbs uh, still felt very repressive, right? Even with all the changes in the sixties, right? Um, although you can also argue that uh, what happens in the lower side in the 70s and 80s just uh, sort of extended the critique of kind of the organization or organized life or one-dimensional life uh that that you know 60s movements critiqued uh but yeah that there was this notion that you could you could find a degree of freedom out there yeah uh, so the, one last thing with the frontier um uh, is, uh, is that it's a it's a very i think it's a very compelling term uh even it's a very it's it's um I think it was literally used in uh, like sort of real estate advertisements at some point, but it, it has this sort of wonderful double-sidedness to it because it, it has all that appeal that the Western frontier had, right? Like you move West and you sort of be able to cre recreate yourself ostensibly, right? But at the same time, as everyone knows, the frontier was not unoccupied, right? The frontier was part of this kind of settler, settler colonialism. And it's the same case with the Lower East Side, right? You had at least 50,000 working class Puerto Ricans living in the, the Lower East Side at the time, it was hardly uh, unoccupied. Uh, and I see you have all these kind of interesting uh, sort of both uh, sort of cross federalization between groups, but also, you know, eventually uh, people, those working class Puerto Ricans are largely driven out, so. Right, which yeah. is unfortunately, you know, we think of gentrification as big buildings, lots of money, it is just, it's anybody moving in from the outside and kind of changing the dynamic and then attention coming in. You do write, which I, I really want to quote, the homosexuals, artists, writers, performers, activists, and entrepreneurs who moved to the Lower East Side in the 1970s and 80s did not so because they saw the neighborhood as a good investment, but because they were fleeing forms of life that they found restrictive and often dangerous. Arriving in a neighborhood still home to a vibrant working class, they often found ways of finding common cause with these residents. It's a, you know, there's something so interesting because it almost ties to the, the first thing we we're talking about with the South Bronx. There's this image that we have of, or not we, but in general, there's this image of slums or, you know, working class and the Lower East Side, what it looked like before, you know, the artists moved in. But the truth is that there, you know, this is somebody's neighborhood. There's culture there. And, you know, with the Lower East Side, there's decades of different cultures of waves of immigration and, and movements and, you know, just everything coming in. And there, you talked as well about the relationship to artists in the neighborhoods that they've come to, you know, the residents that they'll include in their bodies of work, whether that's writing or art. When is the line between observer and participant crossed? And when is the use of people exploitative? So I think that's a really great question. And so I think, Something like uh, between C and D, uh, and I don't know if you have the image of between C and D. Uh, really, that kind of that that journal. So this is this journal that was published by Joel Rose and Catherine Texier in their apartment uh, in the Lower East Side on a dot matrix printer, which I find like completely fascinating. It's like this really early use of computer technology to kind of produce literature. Uh, you know, I think that. <laughs> Doubtless, there are um, any number of kind of uh, literary uh, journals that are sort of run digitally out of New York, you know, obviously. Uh, but this was like a really early example of that kind of thing. But so between c &D would publish people like Miguel Pinheiro uh, um, uh, and Miguel Aguirre, like these New Yorican writers. And it did so in a way that was... Um, well, because between c and it's all dot matrix. And so it doesn't... It couldn't frame Pinheiro, you couldn't put an image of Pinheiro up there and you couldn't put Pinheiro standing alongside a like handball court with a bunch of graffiti on it, right? Like you, you, couldn't, you couldn't make his writing into kind of a brochure for uh, come live in the Lower East Side and experience kind of danger. You just like, it's just there, you just read it. Uh, so I think that the work that people like Rosentexia did in terms of like bringing forward the uh, people like uh, Pinheiro, who had had a lot of success uh, to some degree on his own, uh, Algarine as well, but, uh, but, they, but Texier and Rose certainly brought them to a different audience, right? That Between C&D was just like much beloved kind of thing that you, uh, all the, the best bookstore in your town would always carry it, right? Because it had 
uh, it published David Foster Wallace, uh, it published uh, Kathy Acker, uh, published uh, all sorts of writers that people were really interested in in the 80s. Uh, so uh, when is the line for, so I think that there were lots of ways in which uh, artists, there's there's so much writing uh, in the, about the Lower East Side and from the era that's like some guys in a leather jacket and then he goes and scores some heroin and uh, then he goes and makes art and then he gets mugged, right? And so there was, there's, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's right, that's right. But, um, and, you know, some of that writing appeared in between C and D. But uh, I think that the writers were so often aware of this problem. And so in their case, in Rose and Texier's case, they, each issue of Be- Between C and D came in a Ziploc bag. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, the, the kind of joke or, uh, or the kind of reference was like, you, there were people coming in from the suburbs to buy to score drugs, right? Uh, and they're they're kind of this kind of self knowing wink was like, okay, we recognize that what we're pushing here is not terribly unlike the, the drugs that people come in to buy, right? Like we're also selling this neighborhood, right? Um, in in ways that are, yeah, that like we can't sort of distinguish ourselves from the kind of exploitation that is happening uh, alongside what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question from the audience. We actually have a couple of questions from the audience, but because you brought yeah. up Pinero, this feels like a great time. Can you yeah. share how the Chinese American artist Martin Wong influenced the culture too? Oh man, Wong is so uh, utterly, utterly fascinating. He's he's such a uh, yeah. I don't know. Like, uh, there's so many people in this book that I, I think I felt a lot of affection for. Um, and when I read about Wong, he just sounded like this such a generous guy and such an open guy and then such a kind of I don't know like unique guy like he uh moves to the city and he ends up in this some kind of hotel I forget where it is but like the ceiling's falling in and and he he just sort of um is is willing to live in this space but then that building gets bought he gets sort of pushed out and then he walks around the neighborhood and he sees somebody sitting on a stoop and he's like you know any apartments that, that are available around here and the guy's points upstairs to this kind of building that's like half falling down and says, well, if you go up to the top floor, you can live there. Uh, and so he goes up there and lives there. And then a- as he's living there, he uh, does things like he takes in um, street kids. Uh, he, uh, Pinero is, uh, even though he's been a successful film star at that point, is still going out and mugging people. And uh, Wong sort of helps hide Pinero. And then um, Wong's paintings, which is another sort of image, I guess I could have included, you know, Wong is an outsider. Wong is uh, from San Francisco. He's Chinese American. He's not part of the, the sort of Puerto Rican community, the Latinx community in the Lower East Side. But he paints these paintings that are so, um, I don't know, just sort of uh, loving, affectionate, uh, that, that kind of, and, and that I think for my purposes, uh, importantly, show the Lower East Side as full of life uh, that in ways that but that respects the life that's there, that, that, that isn't sort of like trying to make the Lower East Side into this like frontier, that it's, it's depicting the, the world of kind of these community gardens, right? Uh, of the world of um, uh, the El Bojo, the, the kind of neighborhood, uh, the world of these neighborhood organizations that were trying to help tenants, uh, that were trying to sort of uh, help people survive even when all of this funding had been withdrawn. Uh, so, uh, so Wong will just have these, this really wonderful painting of a, it's like an abandoned building. And then in the tiny, in, 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 this, in the corner, you'll see this couple sitting on a couch, uh, kind of looking, at, looking into one another's eyes and kind of, that Wong's point always seems to be that don't write this place off, right? Don't, and don't, and don't forget that there were people that lived here uh, because uh, they're, they're sort of significant. But Wong, like everybody else in the, book I, uh, also ends up selling his paintings in the gallery, same galleries that, that helped drive out the Puerto Rican residents. So right. and everything is mixed. Yeah. And everybody has to survive. It's, yeah. That's the hard knock. So I always think it's interesting that Wong referred to himself as a tourist. He really didn't think of himself as being a New Yorker, even though he his work is so connected at, to both yeah. community as well as, you know, just this embracing and understanding what's going on. There's a follow-up question. Also other Asian American artists, creatives like Ping Chong, The Basement Workshop, et cetera. Okay. So uh, questioner, uh, whoever you are, you have hit on this uh, part, this aspect of the Lower East Side that I really, really wish I had explored further. Um, and that 
Uh, I, I suppose my current project is sort of engaging with a bit more. So right now I'm writing about um, the International Hotel in San Francisco and the kind of uh, uh, Asian American group that uh, sort of collected around that and particularly the artists uh, that that, that uh, structure sort of facilitated but basement workshop is something that I, I, I I'm reading more about and I would love to know more about so uh, yeah that's uh, that's just a uh, it's hard to cover everything uh, but uh, but I, I, I would love to know more I want to know more about that group yeah thank you for pointing that out so one of the things that sort of happens with the Lower East Side is it splits into two neighborhoods because in the 50s and 60s, due to the booming capitalism of Bohemia, the artists kind of start getting pushed out and they're like, okay, we'll move east. But, and they move to this neighborhood, which is mainly Puerto Rican immigrants and is thriving. And they're like, you know what? This doesn't represent us. We have to change the name. We're changing it to the East Village. So. Yeah. And usually, you know, in New York, that doesn't always go over well. You know, if you think about Hell's Kitchen, no one's ever allowed for that name to actually be changed. But this is this happens. It's accepted. It's very strange. And it's really just it's gentrification in a bottle. But it's also interesting because one block really doesn't they They don't refer to themselves as East Village. And can you talk to us about Loie Saida? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's. No, it's one block. I, I mean, it's, it, uh, yeah. I, it, one block um, in like in terms of history, but in this neighborhood. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think names are so uh, fascinating when it, when it comes to this neighborhood. I mean, I think the, the East Village, right. It's, uh, it's the West Village part two or something, right. And it's, um, I think there are good reasons to think about that name, to use that name, but it was, uh, I try to avoid that name because it was sort of the preferred um, term for uh, kind of real estate developers in the eighties, at least. Louis is, uh, that's, that's a, such a wonderful example of people that live in a neighborhood really attempting to kind of claim it as their own. Uh, so it's Bimbo Rivas, uh, who's a, a fascinating figure in his own right who coins that term in this uh, Lower East Side poem. Uh, and, and it's a declaration that this neighborhood is uh, has these really strong uh, Puerto Rican roots, these really strong Latinx roots. Uh, and Lower East Side almost sort of, uh, it's, it's a place before then, but it, it's by naming this place uh, and giving it this sort of Spanish name, it it makes it anew, right? Uh, it, it takes, and the, Louis, the term Louis side is, is closely associated with the term New Yorkian, right? Which another, is another one of these terms that's sort of coined and signifies too that uh, if, you're, if you're a Puerto Rican American, right? You, you're, you belong in New York, right? You're not just an immigrant. I mean, you're not an immigrant anyway because Puerto Rico is technically part of the United States. But it's, uh, yeah, so I think that Louis side, uh, and it, I love that it appears first. I think it appears first appears first, excuse me, uh, in a play that Rivas and I'm trying to remember, uh, the, I think it's Chino Garcia performing in the street. And then he, uh, Rivas puts it in this poem. So I love that the term has its literary origins. Uh, I love that it, that poem is uh, reprint, reprinted over and over again. It's really this like wonderful declaration of place, right? Um, that poem is almost this kind, it's that, that name does the work that's, that uh, housing organizations were, were sort of trying to do, right? Kind of active advocacy groups are trying to do. Uh, and that name also, I think, performs a similar function to the, the Martin Wong painting, right? Like this sort of continuing, continuing to make these connections. But yeah, I think that that's, um, it, and I think that now there's a, a sign up as far as I know, yeah. somewhere. And, I, I, I know. Avenue yeah. C. Um, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It's also, it's one of these neighborhoods where, you know, we have this idea of community, we have this idea of, you know, community ad advocacy. This is really hands-on and like building from the ground up, uh, you know, the adopt a building uh, yeah. organization, which I think was Reverend Norman Eddy's project. It feels like this very intimately scaled and community driven works projects association where you're teaching people or you're bringing people in as yeah. to how to you know, build up the building, take these buildings that have been abandoned, take parking lots and turn them into community gardens. It's really yeah. hands-on and intimate. And I think it's more there than really anywhere else downtown. Are there, you know, how did this project, how did Adopt-A-Building come to this area? And so are there any 
organizations that are still operating from these buildings that were repurposed. So I'm trying to flip through them. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So I don't know the precise history of uh, where adopted building came from. I know that there was, uh, the city had all these buildings on their books. They were like in REM. They were buildings that had been abandoned by landlords and that the city sort of had to maintain. Um, it's hard to imagine now, right? Like that, that, that the city, that any building in Manhattan would, would have trouble finding a home. But uh, what the city did at the time, uh, this was in response to, you know, sort of activism on, on the part of like, you know, uh, people like uh, adopt a building or the predecessors, I suppose, mm -hmm. to adopt a building. Because I think adopt a building really uh, solidifies once the city uh, makes room for what were called uh, housing development fund corporations, these HDFCs, whereby you could take over a building uh, as a group or even as a, you know, a, a group of, you know, individuals, take over the building, do your own improvements, sweat equity, right, is the term that I guess we, we still sort of use, but that, that was the term then as well. Uh, and then you would get a really cheap lease from the city. And so I believe that a doctor building sort of uh, came about at the same moment that the city like opens up these policies. Uh, it's it's good to remember too, that it's not like the city was always this, uh, this sort of singular villain, right? And there were there are cities, all governments, right, have these like people prodding at them from uh, lots of different directions. So the bankers pushed in one direction during this, the fiscal crisis, and then activists pushed sort of from, from another direction and got these sort of accommodations. So, uh, yeah, the so adopt a building um, helps people to kind of rehabilitate uh, uh, buildings, and they for a while operated out of this. Uh, PS 64, which uh, was this uh, school building that was abandoned. Uh, so it was locked up, I think, in the late seventies. And they go in and they break the lock and they uh, they sort of go in and like rehabilitate stuff. So it was this great moment where the build, the very building that's helping people rehabilitate their own buildings was itself rehabilitated. That building is really uh, interesting because uh, it was sold in the late nineties, I think, or like three point one million dollars or something. But it's still like the. The developer has been in a fight with the city ever since. And I think it has something to do with uh, activist energy and uh, in sort of keeping. So the building is, it's like sitting there in the middle of the lower side, right? You probably, like at least the last time I was there, it was still abandoned and it looked like from the internet that it was still there. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if there are, um, I know that the legacy of those tenant owned buildings is very mixed uh, because obviously what happens is like you, redo this building and kind of bring it up to code and you do all this work and then suddenly it's worth a lot more, right? And so then even some of the people who were heads of these organizations become very, you know, affluent uh, and or what, what people would do is just sell the building because it was suddenly worth a lot more. So I think that while it be, was began, this effort, the adopted building effort began as a way to help kind of working class people, impoverished people sort of stay in their buildings uh, because of the dynamics of real estate, it, it ends up, um, I don't know how many of those end up being sort of like owned by by sort of like working class or impoverished tenants. And then uh, the, the notion of homesteading is also, it's not limited to people who are impoverished, obviously, like you can come in and uh, so relatively middle class people can come in with a down payment and sort of like buy a building and rehabilitate it. Uh, often in co-ops, they would do co-ops to, to sort of own these places. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. It does. Well, I'm going to go back. We have a question. Uh, why didn't the federal government take responsibility for the decline of NYC? Maybe this is a question of the villain or not villain. I believe as a result of government measures, the suburbs grew and industry, industri industries relocated post-World War II. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think they wanted up. Uh, I think there's a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, I, the one that I find the most compelling is that the city, cities all across the country, it's obviously not just New York. I think things were a lot worse in uh, Detroit, uh, obviously, but because New York is New York and because at least in the Lower East Side's case, so much of this was on direct display, you could sort of like really see what was happening a lot of New York, right? But cities become the kind of, um, the villains, right? The kind of like uh, exemplars for why government aid doesn't work, right? Like you can sort of point to the, and of course there, there really are, uh, there is unrest in the cities and you know, the, the kind of um, 
the uh, sort of the urban crisis was to some, it's, it's a disparaging term. It's, it's in some ways a problematic term, but there were real issues uh, in the cities in the sixties uh, in part because like the rest of the country was uh, the suburbs were sort of thriving. Uh, and there are, uh, there's, there's a perceived unevenness in the economy, right? These are parts of the city, the parts of the country that are not being intended to. And then because these parts of the city or the parts of the country are not being intended to these, these big urban enclaves, uh, they become, it becomes this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So if you're, um, uh, what is his name? Uh, William Simon, who was uh, Carter's, I think, secretary of the treasury, uh, you, these places become, yeah, again, examples of why government funding doesn't work. So I don't think that the federal government wanted to help uh, at least the impoverished parts of New York. I think uh, the federal government was very happy to see New York turn into kind of a center of center of financialization. But I don't I, I think that, yeah, it, it was it was useful to have a place if you're Reagan to go and say, like, look, you know, we can't spend any more money on poor people because uh, this is what happens. Right. Everything just gets destroyed. So. Um, yeah, that's that's my rough answer. Is that the, I don't think the federal government wanted to. Yeah. To get back to the artists, your book is yeah. built alongside uh, the works of some of these great writers and witnesses, cultivators, agitators of a period, many of whom are no longer with us. Whether yeah. that's due to just casualties of life, uh, poverty, addiction, or the yeah. AIDS epidemic, yeah. you know, in researching something like this what's the process? What is it like to, you know, to especially go through these people's work, especially towards the end of their lives? And is, you know, I know you were particularly drawn to Acker and this was the open door, but whom or what else were you drawn to? So a figure that I haven't mentioned is um, David Wynarowitz, who uh, people may mostly know from his art. Uh, the Whitney had a whole uh, exhibit on him a couple years ago now. Um, and there was a great documentary that came out this year about uh, Wayne Arwitz. But I, when I first started looking around Acker, uh, I found the Between C and D anthology and uh, Wayne Arwitz has this piece in it called, uh, I think it's 23 portraits, uh, I'm forgetting the exact, uh, of despair or something like that, sort of it's, uh, it's the, the exact name has escaped me, but uh, Wayne Arwitz is this, this gorgeous, gorgeous writer. And so I, I guess when you talk about people that have passed away, the, the memory or the one thing that was so compelling about looking through Wynarowitz's archive, again, uh, you know, all this stuff is at the NYU fails, but I pulled out uh, this piece of paper, which and uh, on it, he was one of these typewritten, all of his stories were on these uh, small, these typewritten sheets, right? Because like for a while he didn't have a steady home and he's, he first made it as a writer. He first wanted to make it as a writer before he became an artist. Uh, and so it's this sheet, this typewritten sheet that has one of these really wonderful uh, monologues, these kind of stories of people that he knew on the streets or that sometimes they were his own stories that he would tell in sort of third person, but it has this footprint on it. It has this like Converse, you know, uh, sneaker footprint on it. Uh, and, um, you know, this is some 15, 20 years after Wynarowitz had died uh, of AIDS. Uh, Wynarowitz, you know, is very um, sort of angry late in life uh, at people like Jesse Holmes, people who he perceived, and Cardinal O'Connor, people he, see, he perceived to be sort of um, making life harder for people with AIDS, uh, queer people. And so I think to see that, that footprint, right, of this man who... Uh, I knew from his writing uh, and whose, whose voice seems so sort of alive in the writing, you know, you, it's, it's very easy to, to like read about and read any writer and feel that they're still there because their words are still there, right? Like when we write about literature, we always use the present tense uh, and that's a way of, you know, indicating that the text sort of lives on, but something about that footprint just felt so, I think I remember sort of tears coming to my eyes because it was just like this this man who had been here and who was no longer here uh, and, and who had ended his life in suffering, you know, uh, like, like so many of um, his contemporaries, you know, and, and, um, <clears throat> and under terrible circumstances, right. Um, Warren Harris wrote very um, movingly about uh, the sort of uh, queer bashing that he experienced, right. The kind of violence that, that was, uh, you know, kind of perpetrated against him, but also the verbal violence. So the, the kind of, ways that, that uh, O'Connor or Helms would talk about uh, 
you know, AIDS and homosexuality, uh, even as this, uh, the, like there were just, you know, thousands and thousands of people dying, right? Uh, the way that uh, it was not perceived as something that was uh, part of the general population, uh, that, that it was this kind of marginal thing. So, yeah, I think that that, that process, uh, yeah, at least in Wynarwitz's case, was very, there's something very shocking about that moment, like I say, yeah. Well, it's a person. It's, it's a yeah, person. yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. It's, it's like that's a kid shoe. That I mean, we all yeah. But that's a kid. There's something very vulnerable there. It is, you know, you said this was something. It was. There is such a niche quality to AIDS when there shouldn't be. This was, you know, it was diminished yeah. as being gay plague or a gay disease. Yeah or being a lower black income disease or being an addict's disease because of yeah. shared needles. It, and there is this, there's something while, you know, awareness is so much better. I mean, we don't think about the, do we really think about the effects this had on a generation, you know, and, and then going through to another pandemic to a, a you know, glo- uh, COVID-19. And it's interesting to, before the, before the pandemic in 2018, with that, you know, retrospective at the Whitney, um, also, you know, his, uh, he had such a complex relationship with his success and he had a complex relationship with being accepted to the Whitney Biennial in 1985. And then in 2018, you know, you, you talk about ACT UP as being with this idea of DIY, they really are this, that ACT UP would not really exist. There's part of ACT UP that's part of DIY. And, um, it's the, the ACT UP goes to this retrospective and protests because it's this idea that not only is it a retrospective of an artist, but it's a retrospective of an epidemic that actually hasn't ended, uh, which is powerful. What do you think that he would have thought about that? You know, having gone through his work and seen, you know, the the complexities of this person who uh, Fran Lebowitz, I think once described as a, a classic background for a serial killer. Yeah, yeah. He had a really rough life, you know. His dad would uh, beat the shit out of him. Um, he he sort of um, runs away to New York, and it's not entirely clear whether he actually lived uh, as a hustler in Times Square or whether that was a story he told. It's very clear that uh, his life was was bare bones. His family was, you know, uh, poor anyway. So I think dad drank a lot. His mom drank a lot, uh, and really built his life up from nothing. Uh, I think that that re- he really is one of these people that actually came to, the, to um, New York and and just crafted a life uh, out of out of just uh, taking opportunity every opportunity he could and just just hustling uh, not uh, so maybe the literal hustling, but then after the literal hustling may have stopped this he just kept trying to like uh, you know like say make it as writer uh, okay that's not working uh, I'll, I'll try uh, painting you know okay uh, I'll, I'll also uh, become a musician right um, uh, you know I'll shoot films so um, yeah yeah his life was really rough and then he had a I think complicated relationship with success as you say uh, this is a person who once threw blood on the steps of uh, Leo Castelli's gallery, uh, a person who, when he was not invited to this new wave show at PS1, went and released little uh, cockroaches with bunny ears uh, in he PS1. Really liked sort of run around. Really he really did. Cockroaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He loved tiny things. Like he <laughs> really loved small frogs and stuff. He's really, it's great. I think because he felt like a, oh, sometimes at least in the beginning, a really tiny, it's empathy for sort of the tiny people in the city. So what do I think he would think? I don't know. Um, I think, you know, he was uh, gratified by success, but also had this, uh, yeah, the complex relationship to it. Uh, we tended to give money away as soon as he got it. Uh, and I think, no, I, I don't know. I, I tend to think he would have been on the side of this activist. You know, he might have, he might have felt happy to have been included. Actually, you know what? It's hard. It, uh, given the way his life ended, there's no way. There, and he was just like for the last two years of his life, he was so pissed off. He was just, and for good reason, of course, of course. Uh, you know, he's living in, in in Peter Hujar's loft. Like his Peter Hujar's died. He was his lover. Like he, uh, and and then he's just he's experienced. 20 years of like uh, of hate uh, direct hate uh, uh he's uh he's and seeing all this vitriol directed at people like him so i guess you know if, if that 
if that by if that retrospective had occurred while he was still alive, there's no he would have completely rejected it. There's no way. There's no way. Now in this alternate world where he lives to be, I forget how old he was when he died. Uh, but if he, he lives to be, I think thirty six. Okay, that sounds yeah, that sounds right to me. Yeah, that's very right, that's right. I knew he was around forty. Uh, so this alternate world where he lives to be in his sixties. I don't know. Does he calm down? I, I can't. It's hard to. I don't. I don't. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to imagine. It's like people like him because his life was cut short. Like he's he's always that guy. He's always that that sort of like um, that vibrant but indignant guy. And it's hard to imagine him that sitting well with him. Uh, I guess especially with the Purdue Pharma stuff, right? He would have been angry about that too. I think. Yeah. And there also is always an interesting relationship between generations of artists. I mean, Acker went through it. Uh, you know, on the one hand, she had, you know, used Rollins's work, um, or Robbins's work, and uh, and he requested like a public apology in writing that she signed, how dare she steal his work. And on the other hand, she had used Burroughs's work and yeah. he called up the other author and was like, What are you doing? She didn't this yeah. is Yeah. And it is interesting how you have different artists um, go through to where like Burroughs and Ginsburg, they had this yeah. kind of period where they, yeah. they went through different uh, generations. They went through different types yeah. of art. But at the same time, this is a generation that a lot of these people are cut short. We don't get to know what they're going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't That's... get to know if they're going to hate everybody or if they're going to be in there, you know, supporting younger artists. I know, I know. Do they, do they, are they like Burroughs and sort of, remain crotchety till the end, uh, but also uh, end up having a slightly- open. <laughs> What's that? Crotchety, but strangely open. I mean, he was he was doing Island Records, you know, music at the end. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or hold up in this bunker, right? But then, uh, you know, Keith Richards or whoever is stopping by the bunker, right? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a weird, there's so many, uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, Gary Indiana is still alive. Uh, and I, I don't know if people are familiar with Gary Indiana. Uh, definitely you should read his Village Voice columns from the 80s because they're a riot. Uh, and he sort of has stuck to his guns. Uh, I think that he's the Gary Indiana of 20, I forget when the last time I read something from him, 2018. Uh, still, but it's still kind of the same voice. But, but Indiana never quite had the success that Wynarowitz had or Acker had. So it's hard to know, um, uh, you know, when I, when I talked to Lynn Tillman, she also seemed to have kind of uh, stuck to her guns. It has con continued to have uh, success in her own way. Uh, so, yeah, I think that that's, uh, I'd like to think that people like Wayne Arwitz and Acker would have continued along the same path. Success always changes you a bit. Success certainly changed Acker a bit at the end, but yeah. There's also, I mean, just in terms of survival, it's going to change you. There's a little bit of, you know, a calm down if you're not super worried about finance as much. Because yeah. there's plenty yeah, of people right. who are famous but still don't have a ton of money. Um, I'd love to talk about the duality of culture workers. What does that mean to you? Oh, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up uh, because it touches on a dimension of this project that I think I, I've sort of made reference to, that, but that maybe I could talk a little bit more about. So uh, for my money uh the so there's this whole notion right that uh, i don't know i guess so this book called the new spirit of capitalism it's uh luke botansky and uh eve Chappello. and what they argue is that uh sort of you have these very rigid forms of life uh, i guess official life like business world man in the gray flannel suit world in the 50s and, and sort of early 60s and then there's a whole pushback against that. People don't want this kind of, you know, rigid wearing a suit, uh, kind of uh, working uh, in an, uh, an office, uh, being under someone's control. They want to have more control over their lives. Uh, and in this context, the artist becomes held up as the ideal worker. The artist is completely in control of their time. The artist uh, is self-directed. The artist is always creating things, right? So all of that is completely wonderful right, until your boss expects all those things of you, right? And so what Potansky and Chiapello trace is the way that notions that begin in the world of kind of uh, 
artists, you know, um, sort of the, the counterculture, or whatever, right? So creep their way into management literature such that, uh, so people start talking about the creative economy, right? And the creative economy is sometimes talked about in terms of, oh, well, that you have these galleries, you have these interesting restaurants in your city, and so your city will prosper. But there's another dimension to it whereby everybody is sort of expected to be creative all the time, right? And their job sort of never stops. And you're always supposed to be uh, hustling, 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 like kind of uh, creating, creating, creating. And I think that you sort of see that transition in the lower side. So what, what all I'm suggesting there is that the lives that artists and writers live when they first moved to the Lower East Side in the 70s and 80s, which were, you know, self-directed, you can sort of uh, come up with new things all the time. Like I say, when are we, you know, like we're gonna create a band, you know, do films and paint, whatever. Uh, that's all wonderful. Uh, but I think that those artists and writers end up having something in common with the people that replace them in the Lower East Side, right? So again, these like tech entrepreneurs, like these, you know, copywriters, whoever, like all the all the all this kind of creativity that the the um, the kind of economy, especially the tech economy, tends to sort of like absorb and suck up. So so I think that uh, being the culture worker is a, a sort of really uh, mixed term for me. I, I use that term to point to the idea that uh, workers end up kind of having to take on the characteristics of of the artists that precede them. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's the duality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have one more audience question. Yeah. Do you think the legacy or concept of DIY is what makes New York City unique among its peers and gives us the toughness and can-do mentality? <laughs> uh, I love that question uh, because that also suggests that DIY is a longer has a longer history than you know the seventies through the nineties, right? That it that it uh, that there's something about New York's kind of uh, fabled grit, right, or that or fabled difficulty that that lends itself to this kind of DIY spirit. Uh, do I think it's unique to you, New York? Uh, I don't know. It's it's a it's a place with uh, that's geographically specific. That's kind of uh, well positioned in the global economy, um, and so I think that what I would say about that is that. Uh, techniques that are developed in New York, right? This, these kinds of models of gentrification, this kind of, you know, artist-driven work, uh, all these kinds of phenomena that I'm tracing in the book, uh, or the austerity politics that come out of the 75 crisis, uh, are, are sort of ported elsewhere, right? So my own city of Dayton, which is, uh, had, has had uh, been down on its luck, uh, really, since the, the 70s, 80s. Uh, now we have like all these kinds of galleries and, uh, and sort of like breweries that look like they're in abandoned buildings or that are in abandoned buildings. Uh, so we are doing it ourselves in, in again, this kind of like uh, warped way uh, some, some 20, 30 years on. So, so that's what I would say. So I don't know that it's like uh, something that makes New York specific, but I think definitely New York sets the template for everybody else you know, because of what it is. Yeah. I think that's an answer that'll please New Yorkers. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You all like to think you're the center of it. <laughs> you are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's there's room for everyone. Uh, I wanted to know yeah. if your relationship to the source material has changed. You started writing this book, you said in 2014, it was five year process. Uh, in just a matter of life and also through COVID, has your relationship to this period, your research changed at all? Uh, so I finished the book before the pandemic, but it's, I love that you asked that question because I was writing, I, I wrote a kind of, I guess, almost like a follow-up piece uh, that appears in that uh, Avant-Garde and Crisis anthology, which is also a, a great book, you know, uh, but it was about uh, PS1, the first exhibit at PS1, uh, and uh, like, so right after PS1 uh, is transformed from an abandoned building to an artist space, uh, and uh, Alana Heiss, who is the curator, she just uh, calls all these art artists to the building and says like, do whatever you want. And so Gordon Meta Clark cuts holes in the wall or in the floor. Uh, there are other people that drill holes in the walls. There are other people that sort of like make these rubbings of the building. And through the alchemy of these artists, the place eventually becomes the PS1 that you know and love today. Uh, so to me, uh, I was writing that at the same moment that my university was doing its best to cut things as fast as possible under the pressures of COVID, right? So austerity politics, which had already been uh, here at Wright State and here in, at universities across the country, was uh, one of the stories of the pandemic that uh, people may or may not be aware of is that at least in universities, uh, austerity was really accelerated during the pandemic because uh, 
suddenly you had, uh, you know, a loss of headcount, right? You had students that, that weren't coming uh, and you just had a reason to sort of uh, cut things left and right. So, yeah, it was weird to, to be writing about this former school, right? That was abandoned because of funding, essentially. Uh, that was sort of like became this new artist space. Uh, at the same time, my own university was experiencing this crisis, you know, this, this fiscal crisis of its own. So, yeah, that's what I got for, for that, for that, my connection to the material and the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. And what are you um, working on now? Uh, so I'm really interested in uh, literary representations of, I guess, building on the activist stuff that I looked at in this book. Uh, so I'm really interested in literary representations of, uh, say, uh, breakfast programs put on by the Black Panthers or yeah. uh, amazing the story. kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. The kind of housing activism that occurs uh, around this international hotel. I'm trying not to make it a Bay Area story, but it tends to be turning into a Bay Area story because I'm uh, mean, also New kind York, of- New York has New York and the Bay Area as its own very magical. Yeah, story. yeah. And I've spent time in both places. So I, uh, I, this may be just an excuse to go visit San Francisco, but but yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, I guess, this uh, additional dimension to activism that, uh, that I see happening uh, in the kind That's of the period cool. immediately preceding uh, what I'm talking about in this book, yeah. Well, I can't wait to read it. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I can't tell you what a pleasure this was. Uh, your questions were fantastic. Uh, okay. And I do encourage everyone to look, go out and look at the other talks uh, that the Tenement Museum has put on because man, uh, you guys are doing great work. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a great night, guys. Yeah, uh, take care. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>